How much CO2 is, uh, is up there anyway? All right, so you know it's 0.03%. And of that, 4% of that is due to man. Hang on, only 4% of the CO2 in the atmosphere is due to man? Then what are we worrying about? Even if we halve the amount of CO2 we produce, it would barely make any difference if 96% is produced by nature. Of course, that depends on Piers Corbyn being correct. Do we have any confirmation of that? Yes, sort of. Human activity is maybe 3% contributing to the 3% of carbon dioxide that's in Earth's atmosphere. It's so negligible, it's a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a percent. OK, not 4%, but 3%. Either way, when I did my video on Stephen Crowder last month, this is the claim I actually wanted to take apart. It's on his blog. Most of the rise in CO2 is coming from natural sources. But for some reason it didn't make it from Crowder's blog to his video. What's his source? It turns out there's only one, and of course it's a blog, by someone called Ed Carroll. Before we try to verify what Carroll is claiming, here's some background. Carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere has been pretty steady for over 2,000 years. And about the time the Industrial Revolution started, when we began burning coal, it started to rise. And when we started burning oil, it rose more, and more again as the whole world industrialised. In fact, CO2 has been rising pretty consistently with our increased production of CO2. Carroll argues that the extra carbon dioxide is not coming from burning coal and oil, it's being degassed from the ocean. Sea surface temperature seems to be driving atmospheric CO2 changes. This makes sense because CO2 solubility in seawater is temperature dependent. His argument is that the sun causes warming and this has caused the oceans to warm and as we know from basic physics, carbon dioxide is more soluble in colder water so as the oceans warm they release carbon dioxide. So, he says, this explains why the oceans are warming and it explains why there's been an increase in carbon dioxide. Sounds convincing. So, what is it Carol is concealing? Well, one thing is that solar output hasn't been increasing over the last 50 years. It's been getting weaker. So, something else must be causing the oceans to warm. Secondly, the oceans haven't been degassing carbon dioxide. They've been absorbing it. So the two pillars on which Carroll's model is based are simply wrong. But this article by Ed Carroll isn't the source of all the claims on the internet about anthropogenic sources being 3% or 4% of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. I did a Google search going back 10 years, and the myth goes back much further than Carroll's article. A lot of them trace back to this 2007 blog by Monty Hebe, which went viral in 2008. The blogger is a former West Virginia Office of Miners safety engineer. He wrote, Human activities contribute slightly to greenhouse gas concentrations, but they're dwarfed in comparison to emissions from natural sources. He claims anthropogenic CO2 is just 3.225% of total CO2, and he worked this out from his own table. The anthropogenic component, 11,880 parts per billion, divided by the total CO2 concentration in the atmosphere, 368,400 parts per billion. But where do these figures come from? First of all, Hebe's figure for natural additions is rather odd. If nature is responsible for increasing CO2 concentration by 68,520 parts per billion over the last 200 years, after remaining in balance for over 2,000 years, then where did all this extra CO2 suddenly come from? After all, that represents over half a billion tonnes of carbon dioxide suddenly erupting from the oceans and the biosphere, equivalent to about 50,000 Mount St. Helens-sized volcanoes, 25,000 of them popping off in the last 40 years. And if most of the increase is due to some mysterious natural cause, then where did all the CO2 from 200 years of fossil fuel burning go? Did nature decide to hide all of our CO2 and substitute it with CO2 from some mysterious source? But the clincher is isotopic evidence that the extra carbon has come from the burning of fossil fuels. Very little of the carbon in coal and oil contains the isotope carbon-13, 
whereas the carbon in volcanoes and oceans comprises about 1% carbon-13. So if the extra CO2 is coming from the burning of fossil fuels rather than volcanoes and ocean degasification, then researchers ought to see the proportion of C13 go down. And they do. So Hebe's claim is looking distinctly dodgy from the start, but let's check his sources to be sure. He says the figure for natural additions comes from the Department of Energy, October 2000. But I can't find any such estimate from the DOV for that year or any other year. What the Department of Energy does say is exactly what other researchers say, that there are no net natural additions to the atmosphere. All the carbon that nature puts into the atmosphere gets absorbed back again. As for the 11,880 parts per billion figure, Hebe says that comes from a 1997 blog by Tom Segelstad. But I've checked, and the blog doesn't give any such figure, or an equivalent like 11.88 parts per million. What I think Hebe's done is confuse accumulated carbon in the atmosphere with carbon flux, because his figure of 3.22% for the anthropogenic component is very close to the 4% that the DOV estimates is the anthropogenic component of carbon flux. So bear with me while I explain this, because in a minute we'll see other bloggers make exactly the same mistake. Every year around 220 billion tonnes of carbon is released into the atmosphere from natural sources like ocean degasification, rotting vegetation, soil degradation, volcanic eruptions, and so on. That's been going on for over 2,000 years, and now humans are adding over 9 billion tonnes a year by digging up and burning stuff that was underground, around 4% of the total. By the way, I'm talking carbon here. The weight for carbon dioxide is obviously more. So, in a literal sense, the bloggers would seem to have it right. Anthropogenic sources hardly make any difference. So, what gives? Well, once again, the answer isn't rocket science. While rotting vegetation releases carbon, living vegetation grows and takes it back. While some CO2 is degassed from the oceans, even more CO2 is being dissolved in the oceans, as I explained earlier. Although carbon is being released by soils, carbon is also being absorbed by soils. And we're lucky enough that volcanic venting of CO2 is roughly balanced by CO2 taken out of the atmosphere through chemical weathering. So it's a two-way street. OK, it's not an exact equation, but it's been pretty much in balance for over 2,000 years, and that's what's kept CO2 levels in the atmosphere stable. So, when a whole load of extra CO2 is introduced into the mix, nature can't absorb it all, and the system is thrown out of balance. Around half of the carbon we release is absorbed by the oceans and the biosphere, and half accumulates in the atmosphere. So, over the last 200 years, it's caused CO2 concentration to go from around 270 parts per million to over 400 parts per million. As I say, I suspect this is what Hebe's done because his 3.22% is very close to the 4% of anthropogenic carbon added to the carbon flux. And the difference could be that he's using older figures. Whatever the case, his citation of Department of Energy data is wrong because the Department of Energy gives completely different figures. And his citing of another blog doesn't bear out. So that's the end of that particular trail. Then there was another flurry of activity six years later when bloggers and posters claimed the anthropogenic component is 3.75%. New paper finds only about 3.75% of atmospheric CO2 is man-made from burning of fossil fuels. Only 3.75% of atmospheric CO2 comes from humans. New paper finds only about 3.75% of atmospheric CO2 EPA is document supports about 3% of atmospheric carbon dioxide. New paper finds only about EPA document supports only about 3.75% of atmospheric carbon dioxide. They claim their source is this paper published in the Journal of Atmospheric Chemistry and Physics. But as we'll see in a minute, the paper made no such conclusion. So, how did so many people make exactly the same mistake? Was the paper ambiguous? Badly worded? No, it turns out they didn't read the paper. As so often happens, they read a blog that told them that the paper made this claim, and they didn't bother to verify it. 
If you click on this link, for example, it doesn't take you to the paper being quoted. It takes you to a blog called The Hockey Stick, run by someone called Tom Nelson. And whatever route you take, direct or indirect, all the claims lead back to Nelson's blog. He seems to be the only one to have read the paper, or at least a part of it, and he completely misunderstood what it was saying. The authors examine how radiation from nuclear power plants in Europe can affect the ratio of carbon isotopes in the atmosphere. Nelson read in the abstract that fossil fuel CO2 in the lower 1,200 metres of the atmosphere are close to 15 parts per million. And without bothering to read or understand the rest of the paper, he immediately worked out that 15 parts per million out of a total CO2 concentration of around 400 parts per million equals 3.75%. So that became his headline. Before I go on, here's a piece of advice, Tom. If nearly every scientific study concludes that about a third of CO2 in the atmosphere is anthropogenic, and a group of researchers discovers that the actual figure is one-eighth of that, they wouldn't mention it in passing in a paper titled Simulating the Integrated Summertime CO2 Signature from Anthropogenic Emissions over Western Europe. That's what's known in my business as burying the lead. They'd shout it out loud in a paper title, Anthropogenic CO2 comprises only 3.75% of atmospheric CO2, and hope for a Nobel Prize. So that should have been your first clue that perhaps the paper doesn't say what you think it says. So where did Nelson go wrong? Well, it's not hard to figure out. The 15 parts per million figure he seized on wasn't referring to accumulated CO2 content. Once again, it was referring to carbon dioxide flux, which I explained earlier. This concept seems so hard for bloggers to grasp that I'll try to explain it with an analogy. Think of the carbon cycle as water circulating in an open tank with a plate across the middle. The tank holds 1,000 litres, 500 in the top chamber and 500 in the bottom. And every day, 100 litres of water is pumped into the upper chamber at one end, and at the same time, 100 litres a day descends into the lower chamber through a valve. What happens to the level of water? Nothing. It stays pretty much the same. This is our carbon cycle. Now let's introduce some extra water into the upper chamber, which is our atmosphere, from a completely new source. Every day we'll add 2 litres of water, representing the 2% of anthropogenic carbon that isn't taken up by the carbon sink, and what happens? The level of the water goes up. The amount being added isn't much, it's only 2% of our total flux after all, but it accumulates, and after 100 days there's an extra 200 litres in the tank. That represents two-fifths of all the water in our upper tank, the atmosphere. So we now have two figures representing the water we've introduced. One figure is 2%, comparing our newly introduced water to the amount of water in circulation. The other is 40%, comparing the amount of this newly introduced water to the total amount of water in the upper tank. At the risk of labouring the point, our bloggers have confused these two figures. I hope the science is clear, but I'm sure a lot of people will still prefer to believe the hockey stick. So here's the twist. The authors of the ACP paper learned how their study was being misinterpreted around the internet and they also traced the myth back to the hockey stick. They contacted Tom Nelson and told him he'd got it wrong. Researchers have occasionally done that in the past with little effect, but in this case, to his credit, Tom Nelson understood and issued a retraction. Unfortunately, the bloggers who copied from the hockey stick were less forthcoming. Jonathan de Hamel, who runs the Rye Heat blog, picked up on the hockey stick's retraction, but claimed Nelson had taken the site down because of pressure from the paper's authors. Even where he hints that this was in fact due to an error by Nelson, he blames the authors for not saying what they mean. And then de Hamel announces that Nelson didn't get it wrong after all. The contention made by Hockey Stick seems to be supported by Old Table from the Energy Information Administration, which shows the same thing. Only about 3% of atmospheric carbon dioxide is attributable to human sources. Look at the table and do the arithmetic. 23,100 divided by 793,100 equals 0 0.029. Well, the math is right, but once again in the caption it explains that this is carbon dioxide flux.
This is exactly the same mistake that Nelson made earlier in the hockey stick and that Duhamel copied, mistaking CO2 flux for accumulated CO2. And blow me down, the lead author of the misquoted paper, Denika Boshinova, again had to intervene to explain the mistake. In reply, she was given a fact by de Hamel that only 3% of CO2 in the atmosphere is due to humans. <laughs> this should be interesting. Boshinova tried to explain. De Hamel said, I don't understand your comment. What else but gross fluxes is worth looking at? There follows a long series of remedial lessons in basic climatology, which Duhamel finally begins to grasp. Then he suggests doing something he should have done on day one. I would be interested in reading the whole paper. No kidding. Then this. Many of us do not have access to the full paper, only the abstract. Studies funded by public money should be available to the interested public for free. A nice try, but in fact this paper is available for free. It's in an open access journal. Hugh Hamill could have got his free copy as soon as he saw it being quoted by the hockey shtick, just like I did. Then Du Hamill complains that scientific papers are full of jargon that's hard to understand. Well, John, then perhaps you shouldn't be running a blog telling people the science is wrong based on a paper you didn't read and which you thought is full of hard-to-understand jargon. Because the problem is, a lot of people assume that bloggers know what they're talking about and blindly copy and paste what you've written without bothering to check it. Case in point, what's up with that? And when it was all shown to be rubbish, Anthony Watts, who runs the blog, made the excuse that, since the original author had worked for the Tucson Citizen, that's Jonathan Duhamel, I made the mistake of assuming it was properly vetted. Well, of course, as we all know, bloggers who copy other bloggers are well known for having all their claims properly vetted. But let's face it, if the authors of the ACP paper hadn't contacted Tom Nelson, and if he hadn't issued a retraction, Watts would still be under the impression that the Rye Heat blog was properly vetted, and it would still be on the What's Up With That blog. Actually, it is. The only clue that the whole thing is bunkum is a small note here saying it has an error. One error? And you have to scroll down to the update to find out that the error is the entire thing. Maybe, or maybe not. According to this letter from Duhamel, which is also printed in the update, it could be censorship, or duplicitous scientists going back on what they wrote in the paper, says the man who couldn't understand the paper. Anthony, why not do what Tom Nelson did and cross out the bits of Duhamel's story that were wrong, so that people can still see what was originally written, but they'll understand it was all nonsense. They won't do what this guy did and copy your What's Up With That page a year later without any indication that the whole thing is baloney. I've been warning about the danger of relying on these bloggers for years, but thanks to the recent presidential election, this warning has finally gone mainstream. We've seen fake news stories about the two candidates and the phrase post-truth applied to the world of social media. But it's not just phony sites that are disseminating fake news. It's far more widespread than that. A blogger makes a mistake, whether intentionally or through sloppy research, or just plain ignorance, his blog is copied by another blogger and copied by another blogger until millions of people believe it. This is fake news being passed around by people who can't be bothered to check it. So you can't trust the people who generate this fake news to get it right or to correct it. It's up to us to do that by checking where these stories come from when they land on Twitter or Facebook. And it's not always from Macedonia.